Hi guys, so we will be starting with uh, paper one. I'll be starting with October, November, 2015, variant one, two. Which type of bonding is never found in elements? So covalent bonding, if you see between two elements, you can have covalent bonding. For example, CLCL, you can have covalent bonds. Uh, ionic bonding, ionic bonding is always between ions. It will always be between a cation and an anion. It can't be between two elements. Metallic bonds. Metallic bonds, for example, you have a sodium metal and another sodium metal. You can have metallic bonds between them. Even alloys, they are metals. You can have metallic bonds between different elements. And van der Waals forces, we know we can have intermolecular forces between elements as well. For example, oxygen element and another oxygen element between them. We can have van der Waals forces between hydrogen and hydrogen. You can have van der Waals forces. The only thing that you cannot have between elements is ionic compounds because they are supposed to be between cations and anions. Question number two, arsenic chloride reacts with sodium borohydride. What are the numbers PQRST when the equation is balanced correctly? What you can do is either try balancing it on your own or you can use the balancing that is given here and put them in, the, put those values in here and try it. <clears throat> now, if you see in option C and D, you have four as the value of P. So most likely that the answer would either be C or D because four is uh, the value of P for both these options. So we can try using the values in C and see whether the balancing works. So you can put P as four, this as three, this as four, three, three. Let's try and balance this. Let's see if the balancing is correct. So you have four moles of arsenic here, four moles of arsenic here, this is balanced. Four threes are 12 moles of chlorine here. And you have three chlorine and another three threes are nine chlorine. So that's another 12. Then you have three moles of sodium here. And you have three moles of sodium here. That is balanced. Three moles of boron. Three moles of boron. That is balanced. Four threes are 12 moles of hydrogen. And you have four threes are 12 moles of hydrogen here, which is also balanced. And the option, therefore, is C. Three substances have physical properties shown in the table, melting point, boiling point, conductivity in solid, liquid, and aqueous state. They told you U is a good conductor in solid, good conductor in liquid, and is insoluble in aqueous. Then they told, so if it is a good conductor in solid state, that means this must be metal, because metals are good conductors. B, but this metal right here, they told you is insoluble in water. B, they have told you, uh, it is poor conductor in solid state. So that means we must be an ionic compound. W, they have told you, W hydrolyzes with water. So W hydrolyzes with water. B is an ionic compound. U is a metal which is insoluble in water. So let's see. Now, if you see all the options for U are metals, but the metal that we're looking for should be insoluble in water. Sodium is, be, is soluble in water. It will react vigorously with water to make sodium hydroxide. So A and B cannot be your answers. The answer, therefore, is either C or D. Option B, um, they, we know that it is ionic. Yeah. And for both of these, your compound is ionic. So U is definitely zinc. V can either be potassium chloride or sodium chloride. Both are ionic. Now W, they have said, hydrolyzes with water. So if you uh, recall the theory from period three, period three chlorides, you have silicon, SiCl4, silicon chloride. So this right here undergoes hydrolysis. This hydrolyzes in water to make silicon dioxide. Therefore, the answer is D. Question four, class X contains 5dm cube of helium at 12 kilopascals pressure and flask Y contains 10 dm cube muon at 6 kilopascals pressure. The flask is connected to constant temperature. What is the final pressure? So you will do P1 V1 is equals to P2 V2. Let's find the pressure, the P2, with regard to flask X. Your pressure 1 is 12. B1 is 5. Pressure 2 is X. B2. Now you've connected the two flasks. So the total volume will be 5 plus 10 which would be 15. And your value of x comes out to be 4 kilopascals. We did this with respect to flask x. Let's do the same thing with respect to flask y. 
So now for class Y, what is the P1? The P1 is six. What is the V1? 10. What is the P2? X. What is the V2? V2 is the total volume, which is by the connection of the two flasks. So 15 plus five plus 10, which is 15. And this also comes out to be four kilopascals. And therefore the total pressure with respect to task X and Y, the total pressure would be four plus four, that would be eight kilopascals. Question five, calcium ca forms a compound called calcium carbide. The oxidation number of carbon and calcium carbonate is minus one. So calcium is plus two, carbon is minus one. Therefore, calcium carbide will be Ca. This one comes here, this two goes here, and that would be Ca1, C2, that is Ca, C2. So the option A is wrong, B is wrong, because the formula of calcium carbide is wrong. Now, they're saying that you react calcium carbide readily hydrolyzed by water, giving you two products only. What will be the formula of calcium carbide and two products of hydrolysis? We've already figured out the formula of calcium carbide. Let's see if when you react it with water, when this hydrolyzes with water, what will be your product? Now, in group two, if you recall, you have studied the reaction of calcium with water. You did the reaction of calcium with cold water and calcium with steam. Calcium with cold water or water gives calcium hydroxide. So this calcium right here with water will give you calcium hydroxide. So the product, definitely one of the products would be calcium hydroxide. The answer therefore is D. And you are left with C2H2. And when you balance it, this will be two moles of H2O. Had it been, had it been steam, your answer would have been calcium oxide because calcium with steam gives you calcium oxide. Question number six, Hess law may be used to determine the enthalpy changes using average bond energies. U is the sum of bond energies of the reactants. V is the bond energies of the product. For the reaction shown below, expression, which expression will give the value for W? So you need to find this value of W, the enthalpy change of combustion of methane. So this is what you need to find. So let's see how we will do that. Now the cycle has already been drawn for you. So I can just make this as CH4 plus 2O2. I'm putting the reactants here, the products CO2 plus 2H2O here. If you recall, Hess cycle, there were three boxes. Now the best thing to do is for these three boxes, when you have the cycle, you should figure out the start of the reaction and the end of the reaction. The best way to figure out the start and end is this way, by looking at the arrow. This right here is the arrow tail, and this right here is the arrow head. Whichever box has the most amount of tails will be the start of the reaction. Do you see there's a tail here and a tail here? So this becomes your start box. And whichever has the maximum number of heads becomes the end. Do you see there's a head here and a head here? So this becomes the end. Now, law of thermodynamics says you can go from the start to the end directly, or you can go from the start to the intermediate and then go to the end. It'll be the same energy. So either you go from the start to end directly, what is the value of energy from start to end? That is U, which will be equal to start to intermediate, which is W plus intermediate to end, which is V. You need to find W. W would therefore be U minus V. The answer is A. Question number seven. The process of electrolysis. Electrolysis is now part of the A2 syllabus. So just skipping this question. Question number eight. Hydrogen can be obtained by reacting methane with steam. This reaction right here is at equilibrium. Is a reversible reaction will be a dynamic equilibrium. Delta H is given to you, which is plus 210. That means this is for the forward reaction. So the forward reaction is endo. Therefore, the backward will be exo. They're saying which conditions will give you greatest yield of hydrogen. That means you need more of this. If you increase the temperature, the system, according to Le Chatelier principle, will try to decrease the temperature. It will favor the endothermic side. So it favors the endothermic side, which in this case is the forward reaction. So equilibrium will go forward and you will have more hydrogen, yes? So high temperature favors uh, the production of hydrogen. Now let's see the conditions of pressure. 
let's see if you decrease the pressure, what will happen? If you decrease the pressure, pressure depends on the number of moles of gas. Here you have two moles of gas. Here you have four moles of gas. Yes. Now, if you decrease the pressure, the Chatelier principle says the system will try to oppose the change. So it will try to increase the pressure and it will favor the side with more moles of gas. So equilibrium goes forward. So here the equilibrium shifts forward. And as the equilibrium shifts forward, can we say more hydrogen is produced or the yield increases? So high temperature and low pressure increases the yield of hydrogen. Answer is therefore C. Question number nine. Nitrogen monoxide right here reacts with oxygen to give NO2 equations given. They're asking you to calculate the value of Kp given that the partial pressures at equilibrium are this. Let's write the expression for Kp. It will be partial pressure product, which is partial pressure of NO2 raised to the power of, it, of its molar coefficient upon the partial pressure of the reactants raised to the power of their molar coefficient. Now, Let's plug in the values for the partial pressure. NO2, the partial pressure is 20, so it will be 20 square. NO, the partial pressure is 10, so it will be 10 square times oxygen, which will be 30 raised to the power of 1. And you calculate your answer for Kp, which comes out to be B. Question number 10. The decomposition of SF6 to SF4 and F2 can be described by the reaction pathway shown below. As you can see, the reactant has lower energy, product has higher energy. So this is definitely an endothermic reaction. And even besides that, it's decomposition. Decomposition is always endothermic. It always requires energy. Now let me show you a classic endothermic profile. Something like this. These are your reactants. These are your products. Reactants have low energy, products have high energy. So let's see. Now, let's mark the activation energy. So the activation energy will be this entire thing right here. And the delta H will be from the reactant to the product this. This is your delta H. Now, they're asking you to mark the activation energy and the delta H for this reaction. So we know this entire thing right here is the activation energy, which is represented as X. So your activation energy is X. And your delta H would be this value from the reactant to the product. Now, they haven't given you this value, but they've given you the total value, which is X. And they've given you this value, which is Y. So can we say that this thing right here would be X minus Y? So the delta H is X minus Y. And the activation energy is X. The answer, therefore, is C. Which row correctly describes what happens when the temperature for chemical reaction is decreased? Let me explain that using the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. So let's see that. So this right here, let me say, is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve for a reaction happening at temperature T. Now, when you decrease the temperature, I'll show the shift. But first, let's mark the activation energy. This is the activation energy. All these particles have energy greater than activation energy and they're all causing successful collisions. Now you're decreasing the temperature. When you decrease the temperature, what will happen? The curve will also contract. So the curve will contract, it will increase in height and it will become narrower. And this right here becomes your activation energy. It's still the same, you see? The activation energy still stays the same. But the number of particles having energy greater than activation energy have decreased. So there will be less successful collisions. So number of collisions will be less. Activation energy will be the same. The answer, therefore, is C. And why do successful collisions decrease? Because now less particles. Do you see only these particles have energy greater than activation energy? So only these are capable of successful collision. Initially, all of these were capable. But now only these are which property decreases descending group two? So when you go down group two, which property decreases, they're saying? So the first thing is ionic radius. The ionic radius will increase because the shells increase down the group. So the shells increase, ionic radius will increase. Reactivity increases as well, is why you see there is rapid bubbling down the group. It increases, it does not decrease. 
shielding that will also increase as shells increase the inner shells also increase and you know shielding is based on the inner shells and obviously the answer is d but let's explain the so they're saying is a thermal decomposition of carbonates so let me take the example of magnesium carbonate so you have magnesium carbonate and let's take barium carbonate now you have a cation and an anion so the bonding between them should be ionic now uh, when you go down the group there's something called charge density which is directly proportional to charge and inversely proportional to the radius as you go down the group the charge density will change because the radius is increasing magnesium has a smaller radius barium has a larger radius so as you go down the group the radius increases therefore the charge density decreases so can we say this has low charge density there's something called polarizing power polarizing power is directly proportional to the charge density because the charge density is decreasing the polarizing power will also decrease so can we say polarizing power will also decrease what is polarizing power it is the ability of the cation to pull the electrons of the anion the lower the polarizing power the less is that ability of pulling the electrons of the anion so this because it has more charge density magnesium it will pull the electrons of the anion this will pull by a lesser amount now the more the polarizing power the more is the covalent nature because when you pull the electrons they kind of exhibit the sharing nature of the covalent bonds so even though this is ionic this is ionic with more covalent character and this is ionic with less covalent character because this had less polarizing power so less distortion of the anion and less covalent character so this is mostly purely ionic so breaking this will be difficult because this is very very ionic this is strong breaking this will be relatively easier so decomposition decreases down the group why because can we say the thermal stability increases why will the thermal stability increase because they become more ionic less covalent because they are more ionic Less covalent down the group. Therefore, the answer is D. The reaction between aluminum and hydrous barium nitrate is used in propellant in some fire fireworks. The metal oxides and nitrogen are the only products. So let's write the equation: barium nitrate with aluminum powder gives metal oxides. So barium oxide, aluminum oxide, and nitrogen as the only product. I want. care too much about the balancing of this equation why because they are asking you about the volume of nitrogen that is produced now the source of nitrogen that you have in the product is coming from barium nitrate in the reactor this is the only source of nitrogen as you can see and if you see right here this is n2 and this is n2 so it's technically balanced if i had 3 moles of barium here i would have had to put 3 here why because you would have 2 3 is a 6 nitrogen here so you'd have to make it 6 here so whatever would be the value here would be the value here because they are in one is to one ratio nitrogen is already balanced you see so can we say barium nitrate and nitrogen are in one is to one ratio the mass of barium nitrate is given to you can we convert that to moles how moles is equals to mass upon molar mass mass is 0.783 molar mass nitrogen uh, barium nitrate barium is 137.3 uh barium is right here 137.3 nitrogen is 14 times 2 oxygen is 16 times 6 so that is 137.3 plus 16 times 6 plus 14 times 2 that's 261.3 0.783 divided by 261.3 that's 2.99 10 to the power minus 3 moles roughly 3 times 10 to the power 3 minus 3 the ratio is 1 is to 1 so the moles of nitrogen will be the same as the moles of barium nitrate because the ratio is 1 is to 1 now you have the moles of nitrogen we need to find the volume moles is equals to volume upon 24 dm cube your answer is supposed to be in cm cube so can i convert dm cube to cm cube that will be 24000 you put the moles which is 2.99 10 to the power minus 3 volume upon 24000 and the volume comes out to be the moles times 24000 the volume comes out to be 71.9 cm cube the answer therefore is b
which chloride of period three element dissolves in water? So they are saying which one dissolves in water. Now, ionic compounds or ionic chlorides, if you remember, they dissolve in water. Covalent chlorides, they undergo hydrolysis. So covalent undergo hydrolysis, ionic undergo dissolution, they dissolve. So aluminum chloride is covalent. So this will undergo hydrolysis. Phosphorus, PCL5 is again covalent. So this will undergo hydrolysis. SiCl4 is again covalent. These will all undergo hydrolysis. Sodium chloride right here is ionic. And this will be the only one that dissolves in water. The answer therefore is D. Which row correctly compares electrical conductivity and first ionization energy of magnesium and aluminum? If you remember, these are from period three. And in period three, you probably remember the trends. Let's see the trend in, across period three for ionization energy. This is for group one, group two. There's a decrease from group two to group 13, group 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So this is magnesium. This is aluminum. Between magnesium and aluminum, there's a decrease in ionization energy. Why? Because aluminum loses an electron from 3p, which is further away from the nucleus, therefore easier to lose. So aluminum has lower first ionization energy. Magnesium is higher. Let's see conductivity. This trend was also done in period three. So let's see metals will conduct. This is sodium, magnesium, aluminum. So sodium is Na+, plus, Mg2+, plus, Al3+. Plus. So if you see, there's increase in conductivity from magnesium to aluminum. Why? Because the metallic bond strength directly depends on the charge and inversely proportional to the radius. The more the charge and smaller the radius, the stronger is the metallic bond. So you see aluminum has a smaller radius and a greater charge because across the period radius decreases. So if this is sodium, this is magnesium, this is Al3+. plus. So aluminum has a smaller radius, greater charge, stronger metallic bond, more conductivity. So higher conductivity is for aluminum, higher first ionization energy is for magnesium. Answer therefore is B. Question number 16. Again, this is on electrochemistry, which is now part of the A2 syllabus. Question 17, a student observed reaction with sodium chloride and sodium iodide with concentrated sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid. Some observations were recorded in the table. Now, this was uh, done in group 17. So you have sodium chloride reacting with H2SO4. This will give NaHSO4 plus HCl. And you will see steamy fumes or white fumes of HCl. And this is where the reaction stops. With sodium iodide, when you react it with H2SO4, it forms NaHSO4 and HI, but the reaction doesn't stop there. This HI further reacts with H2SO4 to form iodine, which will be a purple vapor, as you can see right here. Purple vapor formed because iodide further gets oxidized to iodine. Why? Because H2SO4 is a strong oxidizing agent. Yes, and you also get H2S, which is hydrogen sulfide gas. So, uh, so basically, we figured out that H2SO4 is a strong oxidizing agent. Is why it further oxidizes HI to I2. And if you want to make HI, the possible way to make HI is to react sodium iodide with H3PO4. This will make HI, right? And you can see right here, when you react sodium iodide with H3PO4, you get colorless acidic gas. This colorless acidic gas are the steamy fumes of HI. So we know for fact that H3PO4 is a weak oxidizing agent. H2SO4 is a strong oxidizing agent. And we know H2SO4 is a strong oxidizing agent and iodide is a strong reducing agent is why it's getting oxidized. Yes. So let's see. Concentrated, what deductions can be made from these observations? Concentrated phosphoric acid is a strong oxidizing agent. That is not true. Phosphoric acid is a strong oxidizing agent. That is not true. Concentrated phosphoric acid is a weak oxidizing agent. Now, 
let's see concentrated sulfuric acid is a stronger oxidizing agent than chlorine you can't really prove that from these observations from this observation you cannot prove whether it's stronger than chlorine yes but yes we can prove however that sulfuric acid is a stronger oxidizing agent than iodine yes because iodine the iodide here will be the reducing agent so iodide is the reducing agent so the answer therefore is d a white powder is a mixture of sodium chloride and sodium iodide it is dissolved in water in a test tube so you have sodium chloride sodium iodide so sodium chloride will give you sodium ions chloride ions this will give you sodium ions and iodide ions then you add it to water then to this you add silver nitrate that will give you silver ions so ag plus plus cl will give you agcl which is a white precipitate then you get silver ions this gives you agi which is a yellow precipitate now to because the white and the yellow i mean technically they the colors are different but they kind of look the same so to confirm the precipitate you add ammonia if the precipitate dissolves in ammonia that means it's agcl if the precipitate does not dissolve at all whether in dilute whether in concentrated that means it is agi agi is insoluble in dilute or concentrated ammonia so they're saying concentrated ammonia is added containing x after the test tube has been shaken a precipitate y is observed so that means if there is a precipitate remaining after ammonia has been added that precipitate must be of agi so that is definitely agi and we know agi is a yellow precipitate the answer therefore is d so they saying x is a pure white color so x is a precipitate it could be agi and agcl so it won't be pure white can't be the answer x is pure silver iodide no it will also be silver chloride why is pure silver chloride no why is silver iodide and therefore y is yellow the use of the data booklet is relevant 4.7 grams of ammonium ammonium salt is heated with excess aqueous sodium hydroxide volume of ammonia given off measured at room temperature the pressure and the volume is this much now which ammonium salt was used so basically we we'll, you have to do the trial and error here you have to calculate the moles of these guys and then see compare the moles of ammonia and check which one gives you 1.1 1.41 1 dmq so we do it directly for the answer the answer for this is c so ammonium nitrate you have ammonium ion which is nh4 plus nitrate which is no3 minus it is heated to uh, with excess sodium hydroxide so you heat this with sodium hydroxide so you get ammonia and you get sodium nitrate right and you have sodium nitrate and uh, ammonia and you will have h2 now let's see so so this right here this right here is the equation for the reaction of ammonium nitrate with sodium hydroxide if you see the ratio of ammonium nitrate to ammonia is 1 is to 1 now you've been given the mm, grams of ammonium salts so let's convert that to moles moles is equals to mass which is 4.7 upon the mr which is given to you for ammonium nitrate as 80 so 4.7 divided by 80 the moles come out to be 0.05875 moles of ammonium nitrate the moles of ammonia will be the same and we need to find the volume whether it comes out to be 1.41 or not so moles is equals to volume upon 24 dm cube moles are 0.05875 volume is x and this is 24 and when you multiply the moles by 24 the answer is 1.41 therefore the answer is c now let's move on to question number 20 which has to form an alcohol two carbon alcohol that would be ethanol reacts with a four carbon acid so this is butanoic acid 
So the way to name al uh, esters is that you always write the name of the alcohol first, and this is written as ile. So this is ethanol, so this will be written as ethyl for the ester. Acid is written later as it. So this is butanoic acid, so you will write this as butanoate. So this becomes ethyl butanoate, which is your ester. Answer is B. Which compound shows optical isomerism? That means you need to have a chiral center. So let's see which one has a chiral center. Option A, 2-chloropropane. So this right here is 2-chloropropane. Does this have a chiral center? Let's check. For a chiral center, you must have a carbon with four single bonds and four different groups attached to it. Here you have three H's, can't be chiral. Here you have two CH3's, can't be chiral. Here you have three H's, can't be chiral. So this does not have a chiral center, can't be the answer. B, 1,2-dichloropropane. So you make propane with 1,2-dichloro. Let's see, can this be chiral? No, it has two H's. Can this be chiral? Yes, why? Because this has a Cl, an H, a CH3, and a CH2Cl. So this carbon right here is chiral carbon. The answer therefore is B. Let's check C and D, why they cannot be the answers. So you have 1,3-dichloropropane. So you have 1,3-dichloropropane, can't be the answer because each carbon, if you see, has two hydrogen. They need to have four different groups, can't be the answer. 2,2-dichloropropane, can't be the answer because the first one has three hydrogens, last one has three hydrogens, and the middle one can't be chiral. Methanoic acid has acidic properties similar to those of other carboxylic acids. In addition, it can be oxidized by the same oxidizing agents that can oxidize aldehydes. So they're saying methanoic acid is like all other carboxylic acids, but it has a special property where it can be oxidized by the same oxidizing agents that oxidize aldehydes. Now they're saying which pair will of two compounds will give the same oxidation with fellings. You remember, felling was an oxidizing agent. It was to identify the aldehydes. If you added fellings to aldehyde, it makes acid, carboxylic acid. So that is oxidation of aldehyde. So we call this an oxidation reaction as well. Now, all these options obviously will have HCO2H because that resembles the aldehyde in terms of oxidation with fellings. So the other guy, one must be this acid, methanoic acid, and the other must be an aldehyde. Option A can't be the answer because this is carboxylic acid. This is methanoic acid and ethanoic acid. We need methanoic acid and aldehyde. Yes. Can't be B because this right here is an ester. It is CH3, CO2, CH3. So this is an ester, not an aldehyde. Can't be C because this right here is a ketone. It's a CH3. CH2, CO, CH3. This is a ketone. We need an aldehyde. The answer, therefore, is D. Do you see this right here? CHO is an aldehyde. So it's a CH3, CH2, CHO. This is an aldehyde. The answer, therefore, is C, uh, D. Question number 23. Which compo compound Q can be made from propanone? Which types of reaction will Q undergo? If you see, Q has alkene and a ketone. So Q has alkene functional group and ketone. Alkenes undergo electrophilic sub, uh, addition. So these undergo electrophilic addition, alkenes. Ketones undergo nucleophilic addition. So let's see the answer. The answer is A, nucleophilic addition because of the ketone and electrophilic addition because of the alkene. 24, the depletion of ozone in the upper atmosphere reduces Earth's natural protection from harmful UV radiation, which compound would cause the most depletion of ozone there. So this is from halogenoalkanes. Uh, in halogenoalkanes, halogenoalkanes are used as CFCs. The most, the, the biggest disadvantage of CFCs, which are chlorofluorocarbons, the biggest disadvantage is that they cause ozone depletion. So in the upper atmosphere, they break into chlorine radicals and uh, they cause ozone depletion. So as you can see, only option A has a chlorofluorocarbon. Only this one right here is a CFC. And the downside of CFCs is that they cause ozone depletion. Therefore, you use what, what HFCs instead. Yes, 
as a replacement for CFCs because it goes ozone depletion. Question number 25. Compound X has been investigated for use as artificial sweetener. The two CCL bonds, they can be hydrolyzed by hot aqueous NaOH. And we know this reaction is what? Nucleophilic substitution of halogenoalkenes, where the CL will be replaced by OH. CL will be replaced by OH. Now they're saying the COC bonds cannot be hydrolyzed by hot NaOH. What are the numbers of specific types of OH group before and after hydrolysis of two CCL bonds? So they need to you to identify the primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. Now, before hydrolysis, you just need to see how many secondary alcohols are present. So this is the condition before hydrolysis. Let's see how many secondary alcohols do we have. If you look at this uh, OH, what is a secondary alcohol where the carbon with the OH has two neighboring carbons next to it? So if you look at this alcohol, the carbon with the OH has one and two neighboring carbons. Do you see that? So this is definitely secondary. Now, if you look here, before hydrolysis for secondary, there are two options, either zero or four. We've already found one. So we are sure that it's definitely not zero. So A and B can't be the answers because before hydrolysis, you at least found one. So that means there will be four. You don't have to find all four. It doesn't really matter. But you know, for a fact, they're not zero secondary alcohols. There, you at least found one. So A and B can't be the answers, could be C or D. Now let's see after hydrolysis. So let's check all the alcohols now. After hydrolysis, this will become OH and this will become OH as well. Let's check this alcohol. Carbon with the OH has one and two neighboring carbons. So this is secondary. This one, carbon with the OH has one and two neighboring carbons. This is also secondary. This one, carbon with the OH has one and two neighboring carbons. This is also secondary. This one, carbon with the OH has one and two neighboring carbons. This is also secondary. Let's check this. Carbon with the OH has one. It's a CH3 right here. One, two, three neighboring carbons. Do you see it has three neighboring carbons? So this will be a tertiary alcohol. This one right here. This is the carbon with the OH. Yes, it has one neighboring carbon. So this will be a primary alcohol. So after hydrolysis, you have one, two, three, four secondary uh, sorry, four and one, five. This one is the fifth. Fifth secondary uh, uh, alcohols. This is also secondary because the carbon with the OH has one and two neighboring carbons. So five secondary alcohols. So five. How many primary? One. How many tertiary? One. And before hydrolysis, you had four. So the answer, therefore, is C. The compound below are all produced by plants. Each compound warm with acidified potassium diachromate, which compound will give a different observation to the other three. So you are reacting with this with diachromate, acidified diachromate. The alcohol will undergo oxidation and the alkene will also undergo oxidation. So let's see. Now this right here will become, this is the primary alcohol because the carbon with the OH has one neighboring carbon. So this will become CO2H. This is gonna become carboxylic acid. This alkene will also undergo oxidation where this carbon with a broken double bond has two neighboring carbons. So this will become a ketone. And the other side, the other side has, so this carbon, I put in a different color so you can see. This carbon has one, two, three bonds. Fourth is a hydrogen. So this will become an acid because it has a hydrogen and a carbon next to it. So the carbon has one hydrogen and one carbon next to it. So this will become acid. So this becomes acid, this becomes ketone. Again, this becomes ketone just the same way. Yes. And this side will become the acid. Let's see what about this. This alkene, alkene will also undergo, uh, it will also undergo uh, oxidation. Over here, you have one carbon and two carbon next to it. So this side will give you a ketone. And this side carbon has one H and one carbon next to it. So this will become acid. And this will also become acid. So here we are getting carboxylic acid and ketone. 
Here also we're getting carboxylic acid and ketone. This will become carboxylic acid. This side will become the ketone, just like the, all the other sides. Uh, this side will become carboxylic acid. This side will become a ketone. And this side will also become acid. So this is also becoming acid and ketone. Now, all of these are making the same compound, ketone and acid. So we'll see if there's anything different being formed here. This side will give you a ketone. This side will give you uh, acid. Now this will break. Now this side will break and this will give you, this side has just carbon with hydrogen. So this will give you carbon dioxide and water. This side has carbon with hydrogen and a carbon next to it. So this will give you acid. And if you look at this alcohol, this alcohol right here is a carbon with the OH with three neighboring carbons. So this alcohol does not oxidize. Do you see that? All the other alcohols were oxidizing. They were primary, they were oxidizing. This one does not oxidize because it's tertiary. And also you're getting a different product here. You're getting carbon dioxide and water from this end. This end, this carbon right here has two hydrogens. So this will give carbon dioxide and water. Therefore, which compound will give a different observation to the other three? D. Your other, you didn't even have to really bother with the L alkenes here just by the way but what you could have said that this alcohol will oxidize this alcohol will oxidize this alcohol will also oxidize so in this dichromate will turn purple to colorless but here it will stay purple do you see that so here it stays purple and you see the alkene oxidation is also different but you didn't really have to bother with the alkene so much just the observation of alcohol not oxidizing in part d would be your answer. Question number 27. What is the mechanism for the reaction of ethanol, which is aldehyde, with hydrogen cyanide? So this reaction is nucleophilic addition. So let's see what happens in nucleophilic addition. In nucleophilic addition, the carbon is partial positive, oxygen is partial negative. The nucleophile wants to attack the carbon. So the electrons from the electrons to the recipient, you will show the arrow. This arrow is correct. And this breaks and this goes to this oxygen. That is also correct. Then this arrow in part two is wrong. In step two right here, the arrow that they're showing from the O to the bond, that is wrong. This will make and give the electrons to the H and make a bond with H. So option A is wrong because this step is wrong right here. Can't be A. Part B, this arrow is correct, this arrow is correct. Then this, yes, gives a, a, a gives the electron, makes a dative bond with the H here. This is absolutely correct. And while this is at bonding to the O, the H breaks away from the CN as well. That is absolutely correct. And therefore, this is your answer. <clears throat> it can't be C because the arrows have been made uh, incorrectly. Uh, this pi bond is breaking and the arrows are going God knows where. This is wrong. Uh, and initiation, propagation, termination does not happen here because this is nucleophilic addition. This is for free radical substitution. This happens in alkenes, not in aldehydes. <clears throat> Question number 28. Menthol and menthone are both found in peppermint oil. Menthone is a ketone and this is a Alcohol. Which alcohol would this be? Carbon with the OH has two neighboring carbons. So it's a secondary alcohol. Now, they're saying which statement about these compounds is correct. Both compounds can undergo mild oxidation. That is not true. Ketones cannot oxidize. Ketones cannot oxidize. Both compounds will give orange precipitate to 24 dnph No, alcohol or methyl will not. Only ketone will. Menthol can be formed from menthone by reaction to NaBH4. So they're saying methanol, uh, sorry, men menthone can make menthol. Is that true? Yes, through reduction because ketones reduce to secondary alcohols and they've used a reducing agent, which is NaBH4. The answer is C. Menthone gives a positive test with tolerance. That is not true. With tolerance, aldehydes give a positive test. Menthone is a ketone. What is the skeletal formula for 2 methyl pentan 1 or? Let's see. Skeletal formula for 2 methyl pentan 1 or? Let's see. 
सो टू मिथाइल टू मिथाइल पेंटिन वन ऑल सो पुटिंग द ओ एच हियर एक्चुअली दे पुट द ओ एच ऑन दिस फॉर ऑल ऑफ दीज ऑप्शन दे पुट द ओ एच ऑन द on this 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 carbon so they're considering this as the first carbon so this will be the second carbon so we need to write the skeletal formula main chain has five carbons so 1 2 3 4 5 on this carbon you have a oh on this carbon you have a ch3 you don't show the c and the hydrogen is attached to it so this right here will be a skeletal formula which corresponds to a You see one, two, three, four, and five in the main chain. OH over here, and this has the CH three. Can't be this because this is one, two, three, four carbons in the main chain. This is four carbons in the main chain. This is three methyl butyl one all. So this is not the answer. One, two, three, four. This is also four carbons in the main chain. Or technically, one, two, three, four, and five carbons. This is just pentane to all, so this is not the answer. The answer, therefore, is D. Can't be as uh, A. Can't be D either because it says one, two, three, four, five, and it is alcohol on carbon one, but this one on carbon four. So this is four methyl pentane one all. So can't be D either. Answer, therefore, is A. The structure of aspartame, which is used in artificial sweetener, is shown. If aspartame is warmed in aqueous alkali, which of the bonds one and two will be broken? So you're warming it in alkali. Which bonds will be broken? This right here is an amide linkage. This right here is an ester linkage. So they're saying which bonds will break? So you know that amides can undergo hydrolysis as well, and ester linkages can undergo hydrolysis as well. So both the linkages will break. Details of amide. We will do an A two, but ester linkages, you know for a fact, will break. Amide linkages also undergo hydrolysis, which you will be doing in A two. Section B, the relative molecular mass of a particular sample of chlorine is seventy two. Which properties of the atom of the sample will be the same for all the atoms? So, the MR of the particular sample of chlorine is seventy two. Which properties will be the same for all the atoms? So, let's see. the radius so this is the mr given for a particular sample of chlorine so that cl2 so it could be a cl 37 and a 35 yes so because you have two because it's 72 so it could probably be a chlorine 37 35 two isotopes but the radius will be the same obviously because the isotopes have the same number of electrons the nucleon number do you see that will be different because these are isotopes so that is different it will not be the same do you see one is 37 one is 35 the isotopic mass that is also different 37 35 therefore the answer is b which of the following influence the size of ionization energy of an atom so let's see the energy ionization energy the amount of shielding the three factors which affect ionization energy the atomic radius the shielding and the nuclear charge atomic radius depends on the number of shells shielding depends on the number of shells which in turn affects the inner shells nuclear charge depends on the number of protons so amount of shielding yes the charge on the nucleus yes that's the same as the nuclear charge and the distance between the outer electrons and the nucleus yes that's the same thing as the radius yes so the answer therefore is a question number 33 which equation is applied to an ideal gas pv uh b volume m molar mass p uh, then the, this rho is a density concentration r gas constant p temperature so you know that the ideal gas is pv nrt so you can do pv is equals to uh instead of moles you can put concentration times volume rt yes the volume cancels out so you can have p is equals to concentration rt that's one variation the other variation is pv is equals to mass upon mr instead of moles rt 
the other variation is pv is equals to mass upon mr rt <clears throat> you can do p mr is equals to mass instead of you you saw the positions of v and mr so the v comes here rt and mass upon volume is density so this can become p mr rho rt or you can do p is equals to rho rt upon m so one is right yes m is the mr yes pv is equals to crt upon m so the crt upon m is wrong it is p is equals to crt not p v is equals to crt upon m pv is equals to mr rt that is wrong for mr rt it is uh, it is definitely wrong because its pv is equals to mass upon mr times rt so the answer therefore is d 34 ammonia and chlorine reacting gas phase which statement is correct uh, each nitrogen atom is oxidized so let's see you have nitrogen in ammonia let's see that will be nh3 so you have x plus 3 times plus 1 is equals to 0 x plus 3 is equals to 0 x is equals to minus 3 so each nitrogen atom it's going from 0 to let's see uh, from minus 3 to 0 because in nitrogen it will be 0 let's see in ammonium chloride do you see in ammonium chloride nh4cl so let's see x plus 4 times plus 1 plus minus 1 is equals to 0 x plus 4 minus 1 is equals to 0 x plus 3 is equals to 0 x is minus 3 do you see this phase minus 3 so each nitrogen atom is not oxidized so you see this is oxidizing yes but some stay the same so that is not true and if one is wrong the answer is always c if one is wrong it can't be d it can't be b it can't be a the answer is always c each chlorine is reduced so it goes from 0 to minus 1 yes it is reduced ammonia behaves as a base If you see ammonia is going from NH three to NH four Cl, do you see it's accepting a proton, so it is acting as a base. Yes, because it accepts proton. And chlorine is also reduced, goes from zero to minus one. Answer therefore is C. Which statement about calcium strontium compounds are correct? They are in group two. So let's see. Uh, when calcium oxide and strontium oxide are added to water, they both produce alkalies. So that is true. they will both produce alkalies when you add them to water calcium oxide will give you calcium hydroxide and that will give you strontium hydroxide both are alkaline calcium hydroxide is more soluble than strontium no that's not true solubility increases down the group strontium is more soluble so this is wrong calcium sulfate is less soluble than strontium sulfate that is also wrong solubility for sulfates will be also increasing so calcium sulfate so th therefore the answer is d which description of ammonium ion are correct so you know ammonia plus h plus gives you ammonium ion through dative bonding so you have a dative bond right here and you have this ammonium ion so this is the ammonium ion it contains 10 electrons You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, ten. Nine, ten would be the inner electrons of nitrogen. So that is true. It has ten electrons. Yes. It has a bond angle of one hundred and nine point five. Yes. Do you see this molecule of ammonium ion is uh, tetrahedral? So this is sp three hybridized tetrahedral bond angle of one hundred nine point five. It has three bonding pairs of electrons. That is not true. It has four. One, two, three, four. the data bond is made by the electrons which are also now a bond pair so that is wrong and therefore the answer to the set would be b compound q is obtained by adding h2so4 across the double bond in compound p which statement about these two compounds is correct p shows cis trans isomerism so let's see now if you look at p so you have a carbon with a carbon so it shows cis trans isomerism 
Now you see, show, P it's a cyclic compound showing cis trans in a cyclic compound. There's limited rotation across the double bond. So it can't have cis trans. You can't, in cis trans, you used to change the positions, remember? If these were at the top, then in the trans, they would be at the bottom. But this is a cyclic compound. In this, you can't shift the position because there's limited rotation across the double bond. So P cannot show cis trans. With a cyclic compound, you can't possibly then change the position of these two. You can't have the trans. If, let's suppose this is a cis, you can't make the trans. The answer, therefore, is C. Because if one is wrong, the answer is always C. Q contains two chiral centers. Let's see. Do you see this one right here is chiral? Yes. Because it has a CH3 and OH. And this stuff, which is different from this, which is different. These four bonds are different. One is a CH3, one is an OH, one is the purple highlighting, one is the blue. This is a chiral center. And another chiral center right here. Do you see? It has a CH3 and H. And it has this stuff and it has this stuff. So they are all four different. Yes, it has two chiral centers. You don't really have to check. Once you're sure one is wrong, the answer is always C. Q is a tertiary alcohol, yes. So yes, it is a tertiary alcohol. So it gives a precipitate with silver nitrate. Somewhere all of this precipitate remains undissolved when you add ammonia. So that means this should be what? It remains undissolved. When you add excess dilute ammonia, for sure, this would be iodide. It must have iodide because those, those guys don't dissolve in ammonia. Yes. Chloro, chloro, chloro AGCL. So you're adding dilute ammonia. So in dilute ammonia, chloro will dissolve. In dilute ammonia, what will not dissolve? Bromo and iodo. So the answer, therefore, would be C again, because chloro will dissolve. The one chloro dissolves in dilute ammonia. The answer, therefore, is C. Which compound on heating excess concentrated sulfuric acid produce only one product with a formula C7H10? So when you heat it with uh, sulfuric acid, you heat it with sulfuric acid, the alcohol will undergo uh, dehydration and it will take the hydrogen of a neighboring carbon. Let's suppose this. So it will break away this guy. Yes. And there will be a double bond in its place. So this goes away. This hydrogen goes away. And you have a double bond here. Or you can have it here, either or. Yes. I'm just putting it here. Right. So there will be a double bond here. So this OH with the neighboring H will be removed or eliminated and you will have a double bond here. So this alcohol, it is on this carbon. Now if you look at this carbon, right here, the carbon next to it will be this carbon. It has one bond, two bond, three bond, four to the hydrogen. So it can lose these two, H and OH, and you can have a double bond here. Yes. So you can basically have a double bond here and a double bond here. This will be lost and this will be lost. Let's see this. This is the carbon next to this carbon. So this can lose this hydrogen and you can have a double bond here. And you can lose this H and this OH and you can have a double bond here. Yes. So this OH, this H can be lost. Double bond here and a double bond here. Then you have um, option three. So you can have this H and this OH being lost. Double bond here. and you can have this or this being lost, double bond here. Yes? So either you can lose this or this, you can have a double bond here, or you can lose this and this and have a double bond here. Yeah? And with this one, you can lose the hydrogen of this one and you can have a double bond over here. So they're saying, which produces only one product? Now, if you look in this, with option three, you can't have one product because maybe it can lose this and this. Yeah. It can lose this and this, have a double bond here. It can lose this and this and have a double bond here. So you can't have one product here. Yes, because you can lose and have a double bond over here 
or a double bond over here and a double bond over here. This is not one product. Clear? Therefore, three is wrong. Uh, and the option, therefore, is B. Three can't be the answer. The option, therefore, would be one and two, which is B. Compound C is heated with constantly acidified potassium manganate. This produces equimolar of carbon dioxide and this. So they're saying what could be the structure of Z. So one side of alkene should give you carbon dioxide and the other should give you this. Let's see. So when you break this, the double bond will split here. Let's see, will this give you, this has two hydrogens. So this will give you carbon dioxide and that's, that, that's this carbon dioxide. Let's check for this. Can this give carbon dioxide? Yes. Can this give carbon dioxide? Yes. So they can all give carbon dioxide. All right. So they can all give carbon dioxide from this end. You will get carbon dioxide from this end, from this end. Now let's see what the remainder would be. Now from this end, this will break. Yes. From here. Now let's see all that we will get. So from here in one, you have a double bond, broken double bond. From this end, you have a carbon with one and two neighboring carbons. So this would be a ketone. Yes. So this would be a CCH3, which will give you a ketone from this end right here. Yeah. So this will be a ketone with this, all of this right here. And then you have this. Now let's look at this carbon. If you look at this carbon, this carbon has also one and two neighboring carbons. So this will also make a ketone. So this will also become a ketone with a CH3 here. Then you see this end. This is broken double bond. If you see this carbon, it has one and two and three neighboring carbons. Fourth will be a hydrogen. So this side will become a carboxylic acid. Yes. So it will be all of this stuff. I have drawn a very uh, untidy diagram, obviously, because I just need to show you that how these guys would basically. So you basically have two ketones, one carboxylic acid, and this side becomes carbon dioxide and water. Let's see. One ketone, another ketone, carboxylic acid. Seems about right. CH3, CO with a CH2, with another CH2, with a CH with a CO, with a CH3, then another CH2 with a CO2H. Do you see that? That's exactly what we have here. So A1 is right. Let's see two. So from two, let's see what we will get. You break this and you break this. This side, the blue highlight gives you carbon dioxide water. Let's see what this gives you. So this will be a broken double bond O. This carbon has one carbon next to it and one hydrogen. So this will become carboxylic acid. So all of this will be as it is. Let's see. Now let's see this end. This end right here. So you have this carbon with one and two neighboring carbons. So this will become a ketone. So this becomes a C double bond O with a CH3. This becomes a ketone. Then you have this end right here. Let's see what you get here. The carbon here has one, two, three, and four bond and two neighboring carbons. So this will also become a ketone with the CH3 here. And this is attached to this carbon like this. Again, you have two ketones and you have one acid. Do you see? That's exactly what we have. Two ketones, one acid, and this side gives you carbon dioxide. Let's see. You have a CH3CO, CH3CO. CH2, 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 CH, CH, CO, CO, CH3, CH3. And then you have another CH2, that's this CH2, and a CO2H, that is this CO2H. So this is exactly what we have here as well. This seems right. Let's see option three. This will give carbon dioxide water. Let's see this carbon. It has one and two neighboring carbons. So this side will give you a ketone as well. So let's see. So this carbon has two neighboring carbons. So this will give you a ketone. Then you have this, then you have this, then you have this square thing right here. Now this will break. 
This carbon has one and two neighboring carbons. So this side will give you again a ketone. Yes, this side has one, two, three. Fourth bond is a hydrogen. So this side will give you what? It will give you carboxylic acid. Yes. So let's see. CH3CO, CH3CO, then a CH2, a CH2, then another CH2, CH2, then a CH, CH, with a CO, with a CO, with a CH3, this is the CH3, then you have a CH2, CH2, then you have a CO2H, CO2H. Yes, this is also giving the same thing. The answer, therefore, is A.